It's good to see you, good to be with you this morning. I want to thank you first of all for all your prayers for our family this past couple of weeks. Uh, we had our mother's funeral Tuesday morning. I got to preach the funeral for my mother. I told somebody it was the first time I've ever preached my mom's funeral. So she was a sweetheart. She was a strong lady. Had lived still independently right up until she had to go in the hospital with a broken ankle surgery. You know how that goes. Um, she was ready to go home right up until just a few hours uh, before she has ascended to the presence of God. She would open her eyes, look at me and say, why is this taking so long? Thank you all so much for your prayers. We're in Hebrews chapter 10 this morning. Hebrews 10, I'm going to read verses 19 through 25. And I want to kind of confess to you right off the bat that Boy, getting ready this past week for this message today, just in the Word of God. Just, you know how sometimes the Word of God just kind of explodes off the page at you? This really happened this week in, in a very unique way in my own life. And so I, I pray that uh, the Lord will speak to all of our hearts about this thing. I, I call the message a discipling culture. All right, a discipling culture. So if you would stand with me, I'm going to begin reading verse 19, read through 25, and then I'll pray, then you may be seated. Hebrews chapter 10, 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he has inaugurated for us through the curtain that is his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And then these two verses are the focus. And let us be concerned about one another in order to promote love and good works, not staying away from our meetings as some habitually do, but encouraging each other and all the more as you say the, see the day drawing near. And so there's our message in verse 24, three points, being concerned about one another in order to promote love and good works. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning truly humbled. Again, when we consider together our Lord, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the sacrifice, the love of our Lord that was demonstrated, not just from heaven, but on a cross, on Calvary. Thank you again so much, Father, for this public um, kind of confession that Lydia shared with us this morning of what has happened in her heart when she gave her life to you. We thank you for the sure promise of your word that says, whoever, whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And Father, now as we consider this community that you have brought us into as your children, the family of God, the people of God, the kingdom of God. Um, just make your word clear about our um, just relating to one another in your family. In Jesus' name, for your name's sake, amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Okay, here in the, the Holman Christian Standard is what I read from. and In verse 24 it says, let us be concerned about one another. I think the King, James, King James says, let us consider one another. And this is where my journey this past week really kind of exploded, was doing a, just a word study on the Greek word there about being concerned or let us consider one another. It has an impact in the Greek that our English translation just can't really carry. And so really the, the entire message this morning is to try to illustrate for us the power, the impact of that statement about let us consider one another. 
Okay, the Greek word, you know how we Baptist preachers love to take words and break them down to their root words, you know? I've done that, for example, with the word politics. Have I shared this with you? I know I have some of you. So years ago, I did a study on the word politics. The word poly is a Greek word that means many, and a tick is a blood-sucking creature. Many blood sucking. That's why we don't preach politics at Cedar Heights Baptist Church. Amen. We preach Jesus and him crucified and that's it. Because the arm of flesh will fail you, but Christ will not. Okay, this, the Greek word katatoneo, it, it's two words that brought together. It really means to observe or to consider Fully, or to consider intimately, to inspect deeply. So, you know, just the word, well, concerned about one another or considering one another really doesn't carry the import. And also, it's a very active verb. It's a verb. It's a very active verb. We need to be carefully observing. We need to be carefully studying one another. And this is to the church. This is to members of the church here in the book of Hebrews and other places where the same word is used. That the church itself, the body of the church, we as individual members inside the family of God have a God ordained, the God responsibility, if you will, a God commanded thing here that we need to consider one another. We need to carefully look at one another. Uh, for example, it talks about husbands and uh, Husbands should know your wives. Now that word know means the very, you, it, the husband has a very unique command by God to fully understand our wife. Amen, men? Ladies, amen? How many of you ladies want, really would like to know that your husband really does understand you? Amen? Well, that's what the scripture commands us to do. And that's kind of the import, that's kind of the impact that's being said here collectively Inside the body of Christ, we all, every one of us, I want to underline this for us. Every single one of us has been commissioned by God to carefully know, inspect each other. That's the, that's the opening here of this verse. And then in that it says to do these things to promote love and good works. Um, I want to illustrate what this when it talks about promoting love, that's the second point here, to promote love. I, as I looked at that word promote, there's another English word that I really think would be a better translation of the, the, of the Greek word there, and it would be the word provoke, to provoke. Have you ever been provoked by somebody? You know what, that's kind of what a bully does, right? A bully, you know, kind of pushing at you, whether it's physically or whether it's, whether it's a verbal, uh, you know, pushing, you're being provoked. Well, there's a good sense. That's exactly what the scripture is telling us to do here. It tells us to provoke one another to love one another. And as I was trying to think about how to illustrate this idea of provoking to love, it's a powerful, powerful picture of, I mean, well, the closest I could get to, I thought about this old movie, uh, Facing the Giants. And so I've got about, a, we have about a five minute clip here from Facing the Giants. And I want you to watch this coach as he is provoking one of his players on this football team. And I want to tell you, this is exactly the import. This is exactly the power of this statement that we are to provoke one another to love. So give us about five minutes. Watch the coach as he is provoking his player. What's up, coach? And I'm coming to Westview this year. Lost Carolina, we are. You already ripped Friday night down as a lost rock? Well, no, I thought we could beat him. Come here, Brock. You too, Jerry. What am I in trouble now? Not yet. I want to see you do the death crawl in here, and just I want to see your absolute best. <laughs> what? You only got a 30? I can go to the 50 if nobody's on my back. I think you can do it with Jeremy on your back. But even if you can, I want you to promise me you're going to do your best. All right. Your best. Okay. You going to give me your best? I'm going to give you my best. All right, one more thing. I want you to do it blindfolded. Why? Because I want you giving up at a certain point when you can go further. Get down. Jeremy, get on his back. 
<laughs> I get a good tight hold, Jeremy. All right, let's go, Brock. Keep your knees off the ground, just your hands and feet. There you go. A little bit left. A little bit left. There you go. Show me good effort. That way, Brock. You keep coming. There you go. It's a good start. A little bit left. A little bit left. There you go, Brock. Good strength. <laughs> That's it, Brock. That's it. Not the 20 yet. Forget the 20. You give me your best. You keep going. That's it. No, don't stop, Brock. You got more in you than that. I ain't done. I'm just resting a second. You gotta keep moving. Let's keep moving. Let's go. Don't quit till you got nothing left. There you go. Keep moving. Keep moving. Keep moving, Brock. That's it. You keep driving. Keep your knees off the ground. Keep driving it. Your very best. Your very best. Your very best. Keep moving, Brock. That's it. That's it. That's it. Keep going. Don't quit on me. Keep going. Keep driving it. Keep driving. Keep your knees off the ground. Good to see you, good to be with you this morning. I want to thank you first of all for all your prayers for our family this past couple of weeks. Uh, we had our mother's funeral Tuesday morning. I got to preach the funeral for my mother. I told somebody it was the first time I've ever preached my mom's funeral. So she was a sweetheart, she was a strong lady, had lived still independently right up until she had to go in the hospital with a broken ankle surgery, you know how that goes. Um, she was ready to go home right up until just a few hours uh, before she ascended to the presence of God. She would open her eyes, look at me and say, why is this taking so long? Thank you all so much for your prayers. We're in Hebrews chapter 10 this morning. Hebrews 10, I'm going to read verses 19 through 25. And I want to kind of confess to you right off the bat that, boy, getting ready this past week for this message today, just in the Word of God, just, you know how sometimes the Word of God just kind of explodes off the page at you? This really happened this week in, in a very unique way in my own life, and so I, I pray that uh, the Lord will speak to all of our hearts about this thing. I, I call the message a discipling culture, all right, a discipling culture culture. So if you would stand with me, I'm going to begin reading verse 19, read through 25, and then I'll pray, then you may be seated. Hebrews chapter 10, 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he has inaugurated for us through the curtain that is his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And then these two verses are the focus. And let us be concerned about one another in order to promote love and good works, not staying away from our meetings as some habitually do, but encouraging each other and all the more as you say the, see the day drawing near. And so there's our message in verse 24, three points, being concerned about one another in order to promote love and good works. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning truly humbled. Again, when we consider together our Lord, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the sacrifice, the love of our Lord that was demonstrated, not just from heaven, but on a cross, on Calvary. Thank you again so much, Father, for this public um, kind of confession that Lydia shared with us this morning of what has happened in her heart when she gave her life to you. We thank you for the sure promise of your word that says, whoever, whosoever will call 
upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And Father, now as we consider this community that you have brought us into as your children, the family of God, the people of God, the kingdom of God, um, just make your word clear about our um, just relating to one another in your family. In Jesus' name, for your name's sake, amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Okay, here in the, the Holman Christian Standard is what I read from. And in verse 20, 69, one of the things we did, we had a 20-foot rope. I had a beam across the top. There were four of them, had a long beam. And one of the things we had to do, we had to climb, and I'm, I'm just talking about a rope. It was about that big around. And we had to climb that rope and slap that beam 20 foot up. Now, if you want to know how tall 20 feet is, uh, the brown top up there is 22 feet. So come down about two feet. How difficult do you think it is to climb, just climb a rope? I'm not talking about a wall or anything, just a, a free hanging rope. Climb the, and we had a time limit. I think it was like nine seconds. You had to climb that 20 foot rope and slap that beam. I remember the first time we went out there and I'm looking at that beam up there and I'm thinking, I don't know if I can do this. And there were about 80 other Marine recruits that we were not thinking we could do it either. And we had some real horsey guys, you know, they jumped up there and, and then they, they nailed it. We had one guy that literally, his feet never touched the rope. He just did like this. And I mean, it was like three seconds and bam, he was slapping that beam 20 feet straight up. And there was a guy right in front of me that um, got about six feet up and he just fell to the ground. I can't do it. He started crying, telling our drill instructor he couldn't do it. You know what our drill instructor did? He started to provoke him. <laughs> like the coach there. And I want to tell you something. After that drill instructor got through having a little conversation with that recruit, about three seconds later, he was slapping that beam up there at 20 feet straight up. Amen? Have you ever been in a fellowship that refused to let you fail, that refused to let you quit? That's what Hebrews 10, 24 says. Let's provoke one another to love. I think about this. I see this in Luke chapter 9. In the 9th chapter of Luke's gospel is the account of where Jesus is transfigured. Remember, he takes Peter, James, and John, and he goes up onto a mountain, and he's transfigured before them. Well, now Luke adds something that the other, uh, record, the other gospel writers don't. Uh, the, you know, there's Moses and Elijah appear with them. Moses and Elijah both had been taken, remember, in a fiery chariot, and, and, and God took Moses, and then Elijah in the fiery chariot. So there's Moses and Elijah, and Luke gives us this little interesting tidbit of info. They are talking to Jesus concerning the upcoming crucifixion, the upcoming crucifixion. And I never had thought of it this way before. I've often wondered, you know, what were, what were they, they're talking about the crucifixion, were they just having friendly discussion? And all of a sudden, as I'm going through getting ready for this message today, that, that comes to my mind. And the first thing I hear in my mind is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane as he's crying out to God, if there's any way, let this cup pass from me. Okay? And all of a sudden, it almost, and I'm not saying this is what happened, but there in Luke 9, when Christ is transfigured before Peter, James, and John. There's Moses and Elijah, and as Luke says, and they are talking to him about the coming crucifixion. You know what? I think they're probably, and I won't say they're provoking him like the coach, but I, they're encouraging him. Jesus, this has, we need this to happen. This coming crucifixion. And all of a sudden I thought, you know, if Christ needed some encouragement along the way, maybe we all do. Amen. We all need, and I don't say it has to be, you know, an in-your-face in kind of thing like the coach. But I think all of us come to times where we need a brother or sister to come alongside and encourage us strongly. Don't quit. We need you. Amen. So I want to ask us as a church body, let's just kind of really think about this. Let's think about ourselves in, 
in the role of being one of those kind of encouragers. And then also when I'm at the place that I need some encouragement and I have a brother or sister that comes to me to encourage me, would I be willing to listen, you know? That's Hebrews 10, 24. Let's provoke, let's consider one another, encourage one another, love. And then the third point is to good works. Turn to James chapter two. A lot of people have really misunderstood James and this thing about good works that James talks about. I know when, um, when I, we lived in Oklahoma, there were some, um, there were some Baptists over there that I actually heard with gritted teeth say the book of James ought to be ripped out of the Bible. And it was all because of James talking about the importance of works. And they would kind of get confused like in the, in the book of Acts. If you were in our Sunday school, adult Sunday school this morning, they were studying about there were some uh, Judaizers that wanted, wanted to come inside the church and say you can't really be a Christian unless you're following all the Old Testament law and all that kind of thing. And you know, Paul was arguing against that. It's not the law that saves you, it's Christ, it's Christ alone, amen? The blood of Christ. It's not keeping a law that saves you. And they will... They'll confuse the, the thing about um, keeping the Old Testament law, you know, doing those kind of things with what James is trying to say when he says, you know, you talk about faith, well, I will demonstrate my faith through my works. So let's look in chapter 2, verses 14 through 26 of that little bit of uh, pre-speaking there. James 2, 14, he says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can his faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Oh, go on peace, keep warm, eat well, but you don't give them what the body needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith, if it doesn't have works, is dead by itself. But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works, and I'll show you my faith from my works. If you believe God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and they shudder. Foolish man, are you willing to learn that faith without works is useless? Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was active together with his works and by works faith was perfected. So the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that if man is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, wasn't Rahab the prostitute also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by a different route? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Now the writer of Hebrews says we need to provoke one another to love and also to good works. And so let me kind of rephrase what James is saying here. He's not saying that we're saved by anything other than the blood of Jesus Christ. Get that out of your head. He's not saying that, that works, that we can work enough to get saved. He's not saying that. What he's saying is, is if we really have faith in Christ, it will be, it will be demonstrated by our serving Christ. Okay, that's what he's saying. And that's why the writer of Hebrews says we need to be promoting one another. We need to be considering one another and promoting one another to love and, if you will, to serve to good works. I really can't imagine a Christian life that has no desire, no desire to serve God. I, I just, I don't know. That doesn't... It's like an oxymoron to me. To have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Oh yeah, I'm saved. I'm saved. Well, let me, uh, let me obey the book of Hebrews. Let me provoke you a little bit, <laughs> okay? We all have gifts. We're gifted as a child of God. We're gifted by the Holy Spirit. And you know what? We're gifted by the Holy Spirit to serve God. 
in some way. And let me encourage you here today, if, if you don't have a way that you, a definitive way that you're serving God, or I like to ask it like this, what is God doing through your life? What is God doing through your life that can only be explained by the power and presence of God. That's the kind of work, that's the service that James is talking about. And that's the kind of service that the writer of Hebrews is provoking us to do. Provoke us to love and to serve. Let's bow for prayer. And Lydia is going to come, and at the end of the invitation time, we're going to come by and greet her, officially soared into the life of the family of God. If you're here this morning without Christ, let me assure you, there's no, there's no way to be saved by doing enough good stuff. It, that, won't, that won't happen. There's only one way to salvation, and that's through the blood of Jesus. There's no other way. No other way. And so if you've never received Christ, if you've never come to the place where you realize you can't save yourself, and if you haven't come to the place where you truly feel like you need forgiveness, you need a clean heart, as King David would cry out, create in me a clean heart. That word create is the same word used in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created. Only God can create a clean heart in us. And that creating work only happens through the blood of the Lamb that was slain for us. There is no other way. And so the prayer of the attitude of the heart would be something like this. And if you're ready this morning to make that decision, it's between you and God first and foremost. That's the beginning place. And the prayer of your heart would be something like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I've sinned. And I am truly sorry for all my sin. And I also know that you love me because I know that you died for my sin. Please, please forgive me of all my sin. I open my heart to you. I invite you into my life. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. And I want to live for you all the days of my life. And I thank you for hearing this prayer. I love you, Jesus. Amen. Did you pray that for the first time? Do you mean that? We'd really love to celebrate with you. We'd love to join hands with you. Let's stand up. Jennifer's going to lead us. Whatever decision that God would have you make, you do that this morning. Peace.
I'll be seated a second. Lydia? Where is Miss Lydia? There we go. All right, Lydia, we have a baptism certificate for you here, and also a Bible to commemorate and to remember this day by. Congratulations. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. And we want to give, extend the right hand of fellowship, as we say to Miss Lydia, for this decision. Isn't it great to have a child make this decision? You know, I've, I've shared with our church, we have a lot of guests here today. This is how important this is for children to make this decision because um, not preacher talk, but through social folks that know and through law enforcement. Uh, when I was a teenager in the 60s, it, it was called a moral compass. By the time a, a young person reached 16 years of age, they had set their moral compass for life. In other words, they kind of made their life decision. And so we were taught that after that, after 16, it was really difficult to reach someone with the gospel of Christ because of that moral compass. Do you know what? That was in the 60s, the age of 16. Do you know what it is today? Somewhere between 8 and 10 years of age, children are reaching that moral compass with all of the stuff that's thrown at us in our you know, media and all those kind of things. Kids learn a lot a whole lot quicker than what we did in the 60s. And so I'm not saying the 60s was better. I'm just saying the reality is, is we have to about till the time the child's 8 to 10. And if we don't reach them by then, it's going to be really difficult after that. So praise the Lord, Lydia. It's good to have you. And in our prayer, we also want to pray this morning. Um, I just found out from Angie that we have a, a local firefighter here in Pulaski County, I won't say what department, that woke up this morning and his wife had passed away. No, no, no. His wife found him. Oh, the wife found, I'm sorry. The wife found him. So we want to pray for the, and they're not ready to release names or anything yet, but we can pray for them. And also we want to pray today for um, one of our members, Jean Caldwell, is going to be having a surgical procedure looking for something in the morning. So we want to pray that everything goes well with that, with Jean, with Jean Caldwell, okay? And so let's stand. We're going to have a prayer. Chad, would you lead us in our prayer? And then you come by and, and greet Lydia. All right. And hold somebody by the hand. Would you do that? John. Well, Father, we come and lift Jean up to you at this time, Lord. We know that he is... He's not feeling well, that whatever is going on has really grabbed a hold of him. And so, Father, we pray for your mercy and grace at this time. We pray you guide the doctors as they perform the surgery on Tuesday. Lord, that you give him quick recovery and healing. And that, Father, we just pray that it is something that is easy to get over, that's quickly gotten over, and that you help him to get back on his feet and feeling a lot better, Lord. We just pray for your grace and mercy at this time and for this family of the firefighter that passed. We pray, Lord, that you would use this experience, as horrific as it is, to draw this family to you, to reveal your name more to this family, and that your grace and mercy would just be sufficient for this family at this time. We thank you again for Lydia and the Krebs family, and we just pray for Brett and Missy, Lord that you would just give them wisdom and guidance as they continue to disciple their daughter. And Father, we pray for Lydia that you would just use her in a magnificent way. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.